Go ahead and start since uh, we hit the time. But uh, remember, uh, what we were working on last week was DFS, Depth First Search. Uh, and just to uh, refresh our memories here, remember that you start, you can start in an arbitrary vertex, uh, or you can start at a vertex according to some criteria. The lexicographically first one, uh, the least weighted one, the most weighted one, whatever, wh whatever criteria you come up with. Uh, and what you do is you explore the neighborhood, right? You explore the, and you keep track of several st uh, statistics or several artifacts along the way. Initially, everything is unvisited. They're all white vertices. Uh, and then the first time that you visit them, but you don't process them, that's when they become gray. And we used magenta here last time. Uh, and we also mark a discovery time and a finishing time. They're, they're finished, they're pro processed once you hit a dead end. Remember that we went this way, this way, this way. And then finally we hit this dead end up here and there were no other neighbors to visit that were, weren't already visited. And so we started to backtrack. But before we backtracked, we finished up uh, processing that node, colored it black so that we would never visit it again. Okay. Now, when we backtracked all the way back up here to A, of course, we looked at its neighborhood and saw that there was a black vertex over here, but it was already processed, so there's no reason to go over it again. We don't want to repeat all that work. Okay. So what I want to do, what, and remember also that you uh, potentially have to restart the entire process. That if you have disconnected components, uh, you have to explore one part of the graph, and then if you uh, if other parts of it are unexplored, you have to make sure that you restart this DFS procedure at an unvisited vertex. So what I want to do now is I want to come up with some pseudocode, okay, uh, so that we can we can outline and codify uh, this this algorithm. So here I'll go ahead and say that we're this is DFS. And of course, we're given a graph G and a vertex V. Right? Uh, the input, again, is a directed or undirected graph. It doesn't matter. Um, it, it'll work either way. It's a, but we'll go ahead and go with an undirected graph here. G equals V comma E. Right? So it has a vertex set and an edge set, as usual. All right, we're good. Uh, and a start vertex. V, right? In fact, do I want to name this V? Yeah, might as well, right? Uh, yeah, okay, we could, we could do it th this way, all right? Uh, so uh, initially, uh, uh, I'm gonna put this in parentheses here and then come back to it. Uh, because we might need to uh, tweak this uh, the pseudocode a little bit here. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, that that's the start vertex. But I'm saying oh, okay. let's hold off on that until okay. we get everything else. Okay. All right. So what we need to do is we need to initialize all the metadata that we're going to keep track of. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to color each vertex white, right? In other words, unvisited. And again, this white, gray, black is only used in textbooks because cheap uh, uh, printing in, in grayscale is cheaper. Uh, you can use magenta, blue, and green if you want to. Or you could use, and when you actually go to program this, you would use human readable terms, visited, unvisited, processed, whatever, right? Uh, then I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to start my counter here. I'm going to initialize it to one because remember what we did is we kept track of a discovery time and a finishing time. Now again, if, if, when you actually go to program this, instead of keeping track of those timestamps, you could of course put the vertex into, an, uh, into a list or an array or something like that. And the order would be the, end up being the same, okay? <clears throat> Now, what kind of data structure am I going to want here? So remember these breadcrumbs. Let me go back over here. Remember these breadcrumbs. We started at A, then went to B, then went to C, D, E, F, uh, e, F here. These are the breadcrumbs that I kept. And once, once I hit a dead end up here, I started to backtrack. And I backtracked in exactly the order that I came in. Right? So the last vertex that I visited is the first vertex that I return to 
if I'm backtracking. So what kind of uh, what kind of data structure does that suggest to you? The last vertex that you visited is the first one that you backtracked to. LIFO stack. All right. So I'm going to initialize a stack here. S will be an empty stack. It's going to keep track of all those breadcrumbs. Right. And again, this is the initialization. Okay. Now I'm going to start the entire process. Now to do that, let's go ahead and visualize this. Suppose that this is my start vertex A here, okay? Uh, and it's got a neighborhood, maybe it's got a bunch of vertices hanging off of it. Everything is white at this point because I've not started my DFS, okay? What do I need to do to get the process started? So here's my stack over here. In order to step onto A, right? Now I'm actually, think of it as actually walking on the graph. You step onto A. What are the, some of the things that goes on, go, goes on here that we did last week, last Friday with this visualization? First of all, I, I visited it, so I time stamped it. That's the discovery time. Uh, when I first visit a vertex, what color does it become? Gray. And I need to make sure that I know where I came from so that when I go off to the rest of the graph, I eventually come back to it. So I need to put it into the stack. Right. I need to put A into the stack, color it gray. There we go. Uh, and then mark it right with a, th that timestamp, that discovery time. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to push the start vertex V onto S. I'm going to mark V with count. Uh, that's the discovery time. Right. Uh, I am going to color V gray. Right. And again, these are, this is not the initialization. This is the, actually the first step in your DFS. So this is my initial step in DFS, okay? Now, what is my criteria for quitting? Again, let's go back over here, right? When are you going to stop this entire DFS process? When did we stop it? We went down here, 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 backtracked, backtracked, and then we found that there is still un unexplored uh, edges over here. So we went there, went there, backtracked, 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 and then backtracked to where we began. Think about the stack. What will it look like? It'll be empty. So while it's not empty, and by the way, it's not empty yet, is it? After, because of this initial step here, we at least have V in it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give myself some more room here. Uh, there we go. Uh, so dot, 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 oops, dot, 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 next page. While, this is my main loop here, S is not empty. We will continue the search, okay? <clears throat> now, the first thing we need to do is keep track of our counter. Uh, because remember, I've already time stamped the first one with one. So I'm going to go ahead and increment my counter. Did I call it count or counter? Count. There we go, plus, plus. All right. uh, and now what I need to do is I need to look at the top of the stack. Now, before we do that, let me go ahead and visualize this over here, okay? So think about the middle of this algorithm. The algorithms are induction, basically. How do you get them started? In fact, for loops are, are, are induction. Where do you start? How do you continue? How do you go from one iteration to the next? Uh, and then where do you end, right? Uh, that, uh, of course, it has to be finite uh, instead of infinite induction. So what I want to do is I want to say I'm at a current vertex here, and I'm going to call it X. We came from somewhere, right? Dot, dot, dot. And we need to go somewhere, right? So I'm going to look at the neighborhood of X, okay? Now tell me about the neighborhood of X. 
if there there might be some black vertices here, right? Visited, uh, pro, uh, uh, processed. There might be some white vertices here. There might be some gray vertices here. Right. Do we want to go to process vertices? Nope. Do we want to go to gray vertices? Nope. Right, and remember I'm gray right here, right? Uh, the gray vertices have already been visited. They just haven't been processed yet, All right? Do I want to go back to where I came from if there are white vertices here? No, I want to continue going as deep into the graph as possible before I backtrack and go back to where I came from, all right? So let me go ahead and grab that value here. This will be s dot peak. All right, I'm looking at the top of the stack. That's my current vertex. Remember when I started out here, what did I put at the top of the stack? And what's at the top of the stack at this point? V, the first vertex. As I visit vertices, I'm going to be pushing them onto the stack. Whatever is at the, st the top of the, 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 the uh, stack, right? That's where I am right now. That's the current vertex, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. That, that's one of the basic operations of a stack. Well, it's one of the basic secondary operations of a stack uh, because it's not absolutely necessary that you have that implementation because you can always just go pop, look at it, take a copy, and then push it back on. All right. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look in my neighborhood. Right. I'm going to, by some criteria, this is going to be the next white or unvisited vertex in the neighborhood of X, All right? Now, let me annotate this here. In fact, what do I mean by next, All right? So how, what order do you go in? Doesn't matter, Doesn't matter in general, All right? If you are given an ordering that you, uh, what, whatever is the, least, the next lexiographic white vertex, uh, whichever one is uh, whose uh, edge, right, is of least weight, right? If these were weighted edges, this is one, three, right? Well, I've got two white vertices here. I'll go ahead and take this one because it's lesser weight. Or you could look at their labels and say that this is, uh, B, and then this one is Z, right? Well, okay, I'll go ahead and go to the lexiographically next one, B, right? It's whatever criteria you want to come up with. This could be any criteria, right? It could be lexicographic. It could be random. It could be by weight. It really doesn't matter. Right? And remember, what is n of x? That's the neighborhood of x, okay? Now there are two conditions here. Under this condition over here, we still have white vertices, right? So if it's, uh, if it's valid, then we do one thing. What if we have a different situation where there are no white vertices? Right? If there are no unvisited vertices, is there any way that I can go deeper into this graph? No. What do I need to start doing? I need to start going back where I came from, All right? So if there's nothing in the neighborhood, if y is nil, right? In other words, no white vertices in n sub x. If you were doing this in Python, you would check for its null, uh, none, I think. Uh, if you were doing this in C or Java or something like that, you'd do a null pointer check, right? Uh, but if there are no white vertices in the neighborhood, then you backtrack. Right? Now tell me what does backtracking look like with respect to this over here? Remember, look at the stack here. At the top, we've got X and then whatever else came before it. Uh, 
V1, V2, V3, V1, V2, V3, dot, dot, dot. This stack is keeping track of our breadcrumbs of how we got here. So to backtrack, to go back, what should I be doing? What about the, the X with respect to the, uh, uh, to the stack here? If I'm gonna go from X back to where I came from, V1, how do I go from X back to V1 over here? I pop it. All right. Now, what do I do with it? I'm done, pro uh, I process it, exactly. So, I color it black. All right, that's processed. And then, of course, I process it. Um, yeah. It will be when you start back to when you get back to it. Yep. Yeah. Right. That all the gray vertices are still in this stack somewhere. You'll get back to them. Okay. Right. okay. So I start backtracking, and what I'm going to do is uh, s dot pop. Right. Uh, I already have a reference to x here because I peeked at it. Right. So I don't need to say x is equal to s dot pop. Uh, I will process X, color X black, that is visited or processed. And then as a final step, I will stamp X, that is a finish time. And don't worry about incrementing the counter because I do that on any, every iteration of this while loop up here. All right? So that's if there are no white vertices in the neighborhood. Else, there is a white vertex in the neighborhood. So let me go ahead and delete this here. How do I go, how do I take care of that situation? So I've got X at the top of the stack here. Now what I need to do is I need to go from X over to B. So how do I go from one vertex to the next vertex? I push B, so push. And now I'm on this vertex here. It's like take a, a, starting from here and then I take a step over to this vertex. So what else do I need to do? Every time I visit a vertex, it was white, unvisited, uh, but now it's been visited. So color it gray. And stamp it with a discovery time. Okay? So else s dot push uh, y. All right? Color y gray. Stamp Y, this is the discovery time. There. And that's it. All right. Once you get all the way back to where you started, you're done, at least with that DFS. Now here is where my question mark came in, uh, uh, this actual starting vertex here, right? What's gonna happen with a graph like this where you've got disconnected components? You're gonna end up exploring one part of it, leaving the rest of it unexplored. So what might you have to do? Restart it. DFS, say main. All right. uh, and the input here is just going to be simply a graph. And here is where you would end up coloring all the vertices white. So color all vertices white. And then you can go into a simple for loop. For each V in the vertex set, if V is white, then call this other DFS subroutine on G comma V. 
Now, on the first iteration of this for loop, you might end up exploring the entire graph. In other words, this for loop might only execute for one iteration. Uh, or you might end up exploring, say, five vertices. And then the next iteration of the for loop, you get B. Okay, well, B is not white because it's been visited, it's, it's, it's been processed, we're done with it. Uh, so is C and D and E. So F, oh, okay, that's white. Then we'll go ahead and do this DFS over here, etc. In which case, in the original here, color each vertex white, you would not want to do that. You probably also would not want to keep a counter a uh, you probably want to keep a global counter in that case then. Okay. Uh, so global counter or, uh, you know, pass it in as part of the subroutine over here. Uh, pass in both the graph, the starting vertex, and then that other metadata, uh, your, your counter and your colors. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that, that's that's why I put it in. Uh, or, or a stack in the DFS. Well, I mean, you could have one stack if you want to. Otherwise, I would just make it a local variable. All right, questions on that? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what will the output for both of these? Well, it all depends. Right? It all depends on what the assignment says. Uh, but the 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 core operation here is process x. So what's the point of graphs? Graphs hold data. Right? Uh, that data needs to be examined or processed in some way. Whatever that data is, that determines what processing means. Uh, if it's simply just printed out to the standard output, fine. If it's simply, uh, if it's to put it into an array, that's fine. Uh, if, it, if that data represents, I don't know, uh, a transaction, Right? and you're going from one transaction to the next transaction to the next transaction, uh, then that transaction needs to be processed in some way, whatever that means. Right? It's just data. Right? We're looking at this from a high-level abstract point of view. All right? But it does call, a call to question, what is the efficiency of this? So what is the complexity of DFS? So let's go back to the main part here. Obviously, this is just set up. It's only a one-time thing. So let's focus on the while loop here. Um, how many times is the while loop going to execute? So each iteration of the while loop, what are you doing? You're doing some stuff necessary for the control structure of the algorithm. But you're either pushing something, popping something, or pushing something. One vert of something being the vertex. The vertex, does a vertex ever go into the stack more than once? No, right? That's the whole point of DFS. Why would you visit this vertex again, right? If it's gray, you don't go back to it. If it's black, you don't go back to it. So our first observation is that each vertex is pushed slash popped at mo uh, at, or exactly once. All right? So how many times does that while loop execute? Uh, if there are n vertices, and uh, so Remember, each iteration, you're either doing a push or a pop, right? So n vertices, uh, n vertices, each one gets pushed once and pushed and popped once. So it executes two n times, which is order n, right? So if you just want to look at the number of times that while loop executes, it's going to be linear. But that's, putting, that's kind of putting the cart before the horse. What are you actually wanting to count as your elementary operation? Remember that five-step process. You identify the input, a graph. You identify the input size. The number of vertices is n. The number of edges is m. Which one do you think? Uh, which one do you use as your input? Right? 
Uh, and then finally, you identify the elementary operation. So looking at all of these operations here, what's the elementary operation? If you, if you said pop, then you're done, right? If you said push, then you're done because we've already said that that's going to be order n, all right? But what else is going on here? What is another po a possible reasonable candidate? Those are, by, by the way, reasonable candidates if you wanted to think about it. Uh, think about those, yeah. You have to choose a thing and suppose it was a full graph and everything was connected to everything else, you'd have to check everything. So, determining which one you go to next, all right? So, taking a look at this scenario here, you, should I go there? No, it's black, move on. Should I go there? No, it's gray, move on. Should I go there? It's white. Okay, well that's probably, that, that, that might be something I go to, but I need to check the rest of the neighborhood to see if there's another white ver vertex with lesser weight or lexicographically less, all right? Uh, okay, so check, 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 check. What are you doing? You're doing one check to see if this is a candidate that you can go to for each one, two, three, four, five, six edges. All right, so another thing that you can look at is, here's elementary LM operation. All right, I'll put that down, I'll, I'll characterize that as an edge examination, right? Or examining an edge. All right, how many edges are there? M, All right? How many times is each edge examined? So here's an edge. I examine it once when I'm at this vertex and I look at the, its neighbor from that perspective to see if I should go over there. I look at it a second time when I'm at its neighbor and I look back to it and say, should I go there or not? Right? So how many times is each edge examined? Each is examined twice. Good. So this would end up being order, well, it'd be, end up being uh, 2m, which is order m. Okay. What is another elementary operation that we could think about? Processing. Processing. Right? Oops. And that's probably in practice the most expensive thing. Because if your data is just graphical data, right, and you're going from one edge to the next edge, whatever, 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 that's just the data structure that you've used to represent that data. Presumably, ostensibly, you are storing data in each one of those nodes. That data needs to be processed in some way. If it's a transaction that you have to go out uh, and uh, to the network and get some more information to verify the transaction, you have like five steps to uh, execute a transaction verify that there are funds, uh, transfer the funds, verify the, tr uh, the, the transfer, double check that the new balance matches the old, whatever, whatever, whatever. Like you've got this whole laundry list of things that you're actually processing the data with, right? That's probably gonna end up being the most expensive, right? And that's what I would argue is uh, probably the, the real elementary operation. So processing a node, right? So how many, how many times is each node processed? Each is only processed once. And not at most once, exactly once. Uh, otherwise your DFS was incomplete, okay? So this is going to end up being N, which is order N. All three of these does it really matter at the end of the day? Nope. Remember that the size of the edge set, which we've been calling M, is at most N choose two and at least zero. Of course, you could have an empty graph, but look at the upper bound on this thing, right? M is bounded above by order N squared. So does it matter if you look at this from the perspective of order N uh, versus order M versus order N, oops, N squared? 
these two being the same thing, basically. It's all linear with respect to the input. This doesn't seem linear until you reparameterize the input. Again, what's the input? A graph. What's the input size? If you said the number of vertices, fine. Then it comes out to be a quadratic algorithm right? with respect to the number of edges. But then you probably answered the, question, the first question wrong. If you were actually going to look at it from the perspective of processing edges, you want to look at the edges as being your input, in which case it's still linear. Right? Lots of authors like giving you this, order n plus m. Again, I think that that's a little bit misleading. And basically, it's combining all three of these things into one expression. I think it's kind of uh, misleading because really you should only have one input, one input size, keep it simple. Right? But this is an all-encompassing kind of catch-all uh, result. Right? All right. Questions on DFS? Yeah. It's going to be linear, yeah. Yep. Uh, even if you consider it to be quadratic, again, reparameterize your input. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So uh, let's, I guess, review, uh, make sure that all this stuff is in the uh, uh, notes here. So DFS observations. Um, DFS may need to be restarted at unvisited vertices if it is a disconnected or directed graph. Right? DFS can produce several artifacts. The DFS tree that we looked at last time, a DFS tree or forest, if it's a disconnected graph, Right. Uh, for example, uh, you have tree edges. The edges you traversed when you performed the DFS. You have backslash forward edges, or I'll, 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 I'll treat them differently here. Back edges uh, connect descendants uh, to ancestors in the DFS tree. Right. Uh, only possible with directed graphs. Right. You also have forward edges, which connect uh, ancestors to descendants in the DFS tree. Right. And again, this is possible for all of them. For undirected, forward, back are the same. So we really don't make that, dis that distinction. And then you have cross edges. Uh, these can only connect between components in a DFS tree for a directed graph. Right. Uh, again, the observations here are that in an undirected graph, you only have tree and back or forward edges, uh, backslash forward edges. Uh, for a directed graph, you have all, you can have all four, okay? Uh, another observation here. In an undirected graph, the presence, presence of a backslash forward edge implies the existence of a what? Existence. So remember we've got this tree, this DFS tree. There we go. These uh, red ones, they are all backslash forward edges. What do they form? A cycle. I can go from A all the way to I and then back to A. Right? So they imply the existence of a cycle. Right. Uh, in a direct, uh, directed graph, back edges are possible and indicate a directed cycle. 
um, in a directed in a directed graph all four possible edges all four uh, possible or all four types of edges are possible there we go that's what i wanted to say okay uh, and then of course the complexity complexity is going to be order n or order m or as a catch-all is going to be order n plus m it all depends on what your input size is or is it the edges or is it the vertices uh, it all depends on what your what you view as your elementary operation actually traversing over an edge or examining an edge or stepping onto a vertex stepping off of a vertex pushing popping processing a vertex and that's probably what i would go with 99.99 percent .99 of the time uh, that uh, the elementary operation should indeed be processing a node because right. that's probably the most expensive operation okay all right questions on this all right uh, you can also do a uh a recursive version of DFS in which you don't have an in-memory stack. Instead, you're abusing the call stack to keep track of your breadcrumbs for you. Right? DFS recursion would be you, uh, you, instead of pushing onto the stack, you would call, make a recursive call to that DFS function. Uh, and of course, that's what we kind of did in the first part of the semester where I showed you how to uh, find a Hamiltonian path. You just did it recursively right? instead of using a stack. Uh, but this is the, the version that we just put together here is going to be way simpler. Right? It doesn't abuse the call stack. You use your own stack. Right? Yeah. Um, oh, shoot. I what I was All right. Um, well, if you remember, we'll come back to it. All right. Here's that graph again. Let's do the other type of search. So there's depth first search where you're in a maze. You just keep going as deep as possible before you start backtracking, right? You hit a dead end, then you start backtracking. Breadth first search is different in that you search around you first, right? Yeah, go ahead. Do you remember? Um, yeah. On the assignment seven, there's like something where Gomer has to try to find like a directed or like a cycle graph. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, the definition of a cycle graph, say C n, right, is a graph with n vertices, and let's figure out how many edges there should be by looking at a couple of examples here. What is C three? It's a triangle. What is C four? Square. Nope, nope, that would be a complete graph. This is a cycle graph. C5 would be home base, right, home plate. C6 would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Hexagon, right? So how many edges are there gonna be in a cycle graph on N vertices? Also, in. Right. Okay. Is this a cycle graph? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, is this a cycle graph? No. Nope. So, figure out how you can adapt DFS or BFS for that matter, whatever you want to do, uh, and to determine if G is G, that's your input, yeah. is that a cycle graph on N vertices or not? Okay. It is not sufficient to look at these. It is necessary, but not, not a sufficient condition that these be true, all right? All right, so breadth first search is different in that it you start at a central part, a central point, right? Let's say B, and then you search around it with, you know, if you were looking at this from the perspective of like the Euclidean plane or something like that, or uh, a search, a search and rescue party, right? 
you would search in a radius of, you know, 50 meters, right? Uh, then you would expand your search when you didn't find that person to 1,000 meters, like 500 meters, then 1,000 meters. And then you would search in 2,000 meters, uh, going outward, outward, outward. Now, as you expand you know, physically on a, in the Euclidean plane, as you expand outwards, each one becomes harder. Why? Because going from 1,000 to 2,000 radius means a, uh, a, a quadratic blow up in the actual uh, area that you're searching. Right? That's why you always start at the center and then search outward in a search and rescue. It's more likely that they stayed closer to where they were last seen rather than very, very far away. Right? So that's what BFS does. It starts at a central location and it's not distance. It's not Euclidean distance. It is going to be distance from uh, the, uh, uh, with respect to edges, right? So you're gonna visit the first neighborhood. Then once you're done exploring that, then you'll expand out to the rest of your neighbors. Those are neighbors that are to be that are of a distance two away. And then finally, you would uh, search things that are a distance three away. Right? And so you're always going uh, to the closest vertices first, exploring them entirely before you expand your search out to the rest of the graph. Okay? Let's go ahead and make this interesting. Let's, uh, give, me, uh, give me your favorite vertex here. Where do you want to start? Can you start at B? B? Okay. So let's start at B. So I'm going to do the same artifacts that I did with DFS. I'm going to mark it with a timestamp of one, and then eventually I'll mark it with this finishing timestamp, but I will quickly abandon that idea and you'll see why here in a second. Uh, I'm going to mark it as having been visited. Uh, and I'll, I'll use blue here, all right? Uh, but not yet processed. I'm also going to draw a little bit of a line here. Right? And you'll see why in a second here. So I'm keeping track of what I still need to process. B is not yet processed. B is visited, right? It's been visited, but it's not yet processed. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take it and process it. Process B, right? And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and use my other highlighter here and color it magenta. Now it's purple, blue. I don't know what that is. Magenta and it's purple. Okay. I, I, I don't think I'm colorblind. I just don't know what the names of colors are. Right. All right. So I'm going to process B. That means that it is, oops, I didn't want it to be that big. That means it's no longer there. Uh, I timestamp it with my finishing time here, which is just two. And now what I do is I explore its neighborhood. What's its neighborhood? Everything here is unvisited. So A, C, whoops, A, C, D, and G. Now, once again, your criteria, that can change. Go to the lexi, go in the order of lexiographically next, in which case it would be A, C, D, G. Or if these were weighted, right? Then five, seven, oops, five, seven, three, two. And if you wanted to go in an increasing order there, I would go G, D, uh, A, I meant five over there, A, and then C, right? Whatever your criteria is, that's the order you go in. Let's just go ahead and go with lexiographic order here, right? Because I didn't write any of the uh, weights at all. So A, C, D, and G. Not only that, but I will mark them all as visited now or not visited but not yet processed okay and i will mark them in the order that i visited them to three four five and six okay now b is done it's gone all right so what do i do next Who's next? A. So, A, process it. Meaning that I'm just simply going to color it purple now. Is that really purple? Seven, right? 
All right. I don't know. It looks kind of bluish to me. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, and it's gone. It, it's out. Right. I've processed it. It's done. But now I need to look at its neighborhood. Well, there's an unvisited white vertex over here, an unvisited white vertex over here, a processed vertex back here. That's where I came from, and a pro uh, uh, an unprocessed but un uh, but visited vertex over here. Likewise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of all these edges here because we're going to build a BFS tree as well. Okay? So, what do I need? Uh, I'm going to take these two elements, which are in the neighborhood of A, and I'm going to put them over here so that I process them in that order. Uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. There we go. H, I. They are now visited. Eight, uh, oh, sorry, A H, I. There we go. And A is now done. Right. What's my next step? Well, what's next to process? C. So process C. That means color it purple. Uh, my time counter now is at 10, right? And I look at its neighborhood. Are there any white unvisited vertices in its neighborhood? Nope. So move on. What's the next one to come out? D. Process D. Time stamp it as, what am I up to? 10, 11. Right. Uh, and look at its neighborhood now. So there are one, one, two processed vertices, one vertex that has not yet been processed, but that has been visited already. And now the only two remaining vertices that have not been visited yet. So going in order here, I'll put E and F. I will color them blue and blue. And then time stamp those. What am I up to? 12 and 13. There we go. And don't forget your edges here either. Uh, the edge for I came from A. Uh, and the edge for H came from G, right? No, no. It came from A as well. There we go. Right. Now predict what's going to happen here. We've already processed D, so that's gone. When G comes out, what's going to happen? I oh, just process it, and that's it. 14, All right? There's nothing. Uh, everything has been visited at least once now, right? So, what happens when H comes out? H is going to be processed at 15, and it's done. I, E, F, with finish times of 16, 17, and 18. And they're all gone now. Why did I draw it like this? What is this thing? Things went in one end, and they came out the other. That is a Q. BFS is essentially DFS with a different data structure. Uh, you put stuff in, you take stuff out. You put stuff in, you take stuff out. If you do this with a stack, that ends up giving you DFS. If you take this, uh, take this almost virtually the same exact code and you replace it with a Q, it gives you BFS. Right. Not only that, but you have the same artifacts. Let me go ahead and uh, draw the BFS tree here. All right, so where did we get start? B. And then we went to A, C, D, G. A, C, D, G. Right. And then from A, we went to I and H. H and I. Right. 
Uh, from C, we went to nowhere. From D, we went to E and F. Is that everybody? Yep, that's everybody. Now, what about all of these other edges? I connecting F. What does that look like? That's a cross edge. What about F connecting E? Also a cross edge. Siblings. Uh, what about C and D? Also siblings, cross edge. A and C, siblings, cross edge. Uh, G and H, also a cross edge. Okay. I'm starting to see a pattern here. Can I have a forward edge? This is an undirected graph now. Forward slash back edge. Is that possible? What if B and H were connected? Yeah, we would have already explored that when we initially did the DFS. In other words, this is not possible. So, whereas with DFS, you only have tree, undirected graphs, you only have tree edges and forward slash back edges. With BFS, undirected graphs, you only have uh, tree edges and cross edges instead. All right, we'll write the pseudocode on Friday. <laughs>